All right, today I'm in Grimsby with Craig Edwards. Uh, Craig is an ex-professional snooker player and a snooker and golf tipster and punter. Correct, Craig? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, now, let's talk about your, your um, snooker career to begin with. I mean, you were a professional at 19. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was midway through my A-levels when they started the qualifying process at 17, and I was already playing the pro-ams, earning good money. Um, and it's a two-year process to qualify back then. You had to get, they had to get in the top eight to get in the world's 128. And it was ultra competitive. I probably qualified before I was ready in a way. Um, we had to go to Pontins, Pristatin, where they had on the buses uh, twice and two other tournaments. And I made the final of one, the first one, and uh, was consistent all around. So, yeah, I got my status by 1988, I think it was. I started in the summer of 1988 uh, as a professional. Um, yeah, and that, that, was, that was the beginning of it. Um, and um, I think the sec after the second season, I got into the world's top 64. Um, then I had three seasons in the world's top 64. So you guaranteed a reasonable income back then. Um, but there was only six or eight tournaments. It was very pressurised. Um, uh, very difficult. You know, if you lost your confidence, your whole season could be gone. Um, and uh, you know nowadays the lads have got 20, 20 tournaments a year and it's been a lot better for them you know they've probably been able to relax a little bit more um, and uh, back then it was like uh, every match felt like a final sort of thing yeah. so um, yeah it was difficult and your, your interest in betting that, that, there was a lot of betting going on around you at, at that time yeah there was a uh, quite a lot of betting goes on um, and up the snooker club, I'd be across in the in the bookmakers um, quite early doors sometimes, you know, by the afternoon before the racing. I'd have played for three or four hours, gone across. So I knew how to place a bet even before I was 18. You know, you'd be across there back in them days. No one really policed it. Um, and everyone would be betting up the snooker club. You'd be playing for money. You'd be playing points. Um, so it'd be, you might start at a penny point or 20p a point, the guy that follows you, you'd pay him. Uh, so if someone made 100 break, you were, you know, um, it could get quite expensive. Um, so I was always around betting, but I wasn't very good at it. I was just gambling back then. And, um, you know, I did play a few money matches where uh, you'd have backers and they would put up a, a sum of money and you'd play for, your fee would either be 10 or 20%. Um, of the winnings um, and the backers had the risk um, there was quite a culture of it back then yeah. um, you know and kind of I can see you know how the sport nowadays is um, with this current thing with the betting scandal and of course they have a zero tolerance on the world professional tour nowadays no one you're not allowed to bet on any snooker match not even anyone else's you're not allowed to place a bet in your own name in a snooker account if you do you'll be banned and uh, that's where it's got to but back then people were hedging their own matches um, hedging their own high breaks and uh, I doubt it wasn't fixing this there was no real fixing I think this Francisco's did but um, yeah it was uh, betting was around all the time and you were getting some good marks on the horses yeah, well, I played at Ray Edmonds Snook Centre. Ray was, well, a shrewd punter. Probably learned a lot of good habits from him from that time, used now. And um, he had a guy who had the inside track at Shannon's, Kumani's, Stout's, Nicky Anderson's. Um, and this guy would fence off some of the money. We'd have to back the horses a bit, certain ones. Uh, because I think the, the head lads were getting a free £500 bet at the time on, uh, you know, and that's the early 90s. Um, and so we got, I mean, we had some great ones. Shannon had a period where he was winning all the juvenile races with Queen's Logic, Josra, Algahood, Bintalea, just to name three. And we were on them from being a juvenile. And, uh, you know, that... That at that time there was two or three in front of him in the main races 
uh, because of the reputations of the trainers at that point. I think Shannon was just making his reputation in them uh, them races. So um, we had some nice runs there. Um, Kumani, we got high rise in the first time. I went to a handicap at Pontefract. My mate run me. I was sat watching the cricket at Derby, and he says, says Kumani's got one. Pontefract is going to win. He says, that's all I've heard. Well, it says it won't get beat. It can't, won't hear it getting beat. It's just got to stand up. So I think it won at five to two. I had a good bet on it, but if I'd known it was going to win the Derby two races later, I would have had a lot more on it. And um, I mean, its next race was the Lingfield Derby trial. And he says, well, we fancy it to run really well. But of course, they were never going to, you couldn't tip it in that sort of race. Um, and yeah, it was nice. Got some really good information yeah we had some we had some losers as well like you do um but i realized you got to know that you you had a, an edge and um ray himself had horses with mick easter b um mick easter b ray was really friendly with robin o'ryan who was tom o'ryan who wrote for the racing post he was his brother and i think he's worked for Fahi raymond Fahey in recent years he was a clever guy um of course, Mick Easterby, you had all the old sprinters. He would be, you know, foist and blessing in disguise. Every time they got down to the mat, they would probably always run up a little sequence. Um, real clever trainer. Um, I mean, the, the, best, the best story of making a few, Bob, well, I probably missed out. Um, a horse for Michael Stout won on the final day of the o uh, Oaks Day at Epsom, top Durham, and a couple of years later, Never run again. A couple of years later, it turned up at McEasterby's yard. I said to my mate, what's that doing there? He says, well, it must have gone wrong. And McEasterby started it on a Sunday in a cellar. And it went in a claimer. And then never run, it run last. And then it was on a Monday night at a um, very low level handicap, I think it was, at, at Thirsk. And uh, last race. And I'd gone to work at the shop at that time. I'd packed in snooker, gone to work at the shop. And I'd left some bets on Betfair. They got matched at silly numbers, 40, 30, 20. Remember, that's the afternoon. Mate rung me about 10 to 9. I was just shutting up the shop. He says to me, this one of Easterbys ain't going to get beaten in the last race. Just, they've just let us know. It's last minute. It was 9 to 4 by then. Top Durham. So it come in, it was, I mean, I think his open tissue with the bookies was something like 20 to one. And uh, he never moved an inch on it, a jockey. And um, I mean, he had trouble, I think, just keeping the distance back. And, uh, you know, they pulled Mick Easterby in the stewards, but they ain't gonna get anywhere with Mick Easterby. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was just a serious, and the next race to show how good it was, it won the Carlisle Bell. So it went from two races ago running in claimers or sellers to winning that. And, you know, <laughs> and I think that was it. It never really won a decent race again. Now, now when, you were, when you were playing, everybody yeah. knows all the stars from the 80s. I yeah. still remember them if you were around. So you, any, any particular stories like Alex Higgins, for example? Well, <laughs> I mean, first time I'm, uh, well, the first time I met Higgins was in Scotland and I was due to play him. It was one of my, about my second tournament as a pro. I'd won qualifying rounds and was in a club. It was a lower ranking event. And I'd heard that he'd been in a fight in Glasgow. And he turned up, it was a Saturday night in the club. The club was absolutely on the rafters. It were like, it was packed. And in walked Alex, two black eyes. He's queuing a plastic black tube cue case, which is something you'd find in all snooker clubs, not a normal case. He comes in with his minders. And, um, you know, we get to the table and he says, her baby face, and then we toss the coin. And he says, um, Ed, he says, uh, I'll let you break. He says, make sure you get a shot. And uh, it's a good game. And he goes, that's what it's like to shake hands with the devil. So I ended up being 3-1 up, feeling totally overawed, 4-2 up feeling totally overawed still because he was just awful. He couldn't he couldn't spin a couple of balls together. But at four two down, 
with everyone baying, everyone watching because the tents, he never missed a ball for three frames. And that was his stage. That was how he lived. Lived on the edge. He loved to take a match to its edge like that. I'd seen him do it years prior when he played Ray at the Guildhall, funnily enough. Been eight, six down, done similar. When that, that, was, that was a massive event, the UK Championship. And there was, there was a couple of thousand people there then. But, um, and he just, that was, that was Alex. And um, next time I saw him was the January after, I think that was a September. First time I'd qualified for the final stages of a tournament, it was, it was the European Open in Deauville. And the casino there, I, I think it had the car from Back to the Future, the DeLorean car sat outside. And um, Alex had just fallen out the window of his girlfriend's house. I think it was Siobhan Kidd, Eddie Kidd's ex-wife. Uh, he'd fallen out the first floor. So he, he was on crutches. And we'd gone across um, a coach from the WPBSA, took all the players that wanted to go, We'd gone across on the boat, on the ferries like that, and, and Alex is on crutches and he's drunk and he's like that. And so I was in the, um, I was in the perfume store. I was gonna get some duty free for my mum, I lived at home at the time, so I found this and he goes, I'll have what baby face is having, he says. That come from the back. He says, are you getting up for you? I said, I'm getting up for my mum. Didn't think of it. He's half taking the mickey. That's how it's kind of how he was. The next year, a year on or something, my mum never come to watch me. She come to Norbrook Castle and I'm sat with her before I start. He comes up to her and he goes, now then, Mrs. Edwards, pleased to meet you. I met your son on the boat, and uh, I remember him getting you that perfume. Well, my son, my mum, my you know, to her, he was a bad boy, and she wouldn't watch him on the snooker. She loved the snooker, but that gave her a complete 360 degrees of who he was, and after that, she never missed him playing, and she felt like, you know, that was charming, and he was a friend, and... Uh, that was my mum in a nutshell, you know, it was, um, so yeah, there's a, there's a few stories, I mean, it's so one. We, um, we, we go to the, the Stephen Treston Davis. Yeah. Now you were 4-3 up against him. Yeah. You ended up losing 5-4 in 1991. I mean, how much do you think your life would have changed had you beaten him? Well, that was in the last 16 of the European Open, and I would have played Doug Mountjoy after in the last eight. And Doug was just starting to go back into a decline because he'd won the two tournaments back to back on his comeback the season before. Uh, yeah, I think um, I would have had you know, a realistic chance of making the semi final, um, which would have probably changed things at the time. It would have probably been a five figure check. Um, and um, yeah, you just don't know. I mean, I, at 4 3 up, I got one chance to finish off Davis, um, got quite a nice. Left in around the blue spot where I could make 30 or 40 quite easily. And I lost position on about, after I'd potted six or seven balls. And um, it didn't take long that before I knew it. I lost position, played safe. And Davis just made 80, made 80 in the last. And um, that was that. <laughs> you had your chance and that was it was gone in an instant. 